Lord, we thank you for the, the working of your Holy Spirit within your people. I thank you that you've had Gay go on this trip to Puerto Rico. Pray that her language skills would be all that they, she would desire of them to be and that she'd be able to communicate the love of Jesus Christ to the, the, the children and the adults that she'll interact with. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the healings that you bring to us physically and for those things that you choose to allow us to carry on with and to walk through our days with. We pray that it would glorify you. We thank you for the, the teachings that you send our way, even when they're hard and how they're sometimes difficult, either emotionally or, or psychologically or spiritually, and yet your hand is always good and you are growing us into something that will, will bring honor and glory to you. So, Father, I, I confess that we're a foolish people. Uh, it's not because of our goodness that we dare to approach you, but it is because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. All of us deserve uh, the harsh anger poured out on us because we're unrighteous rebels against a righteous Lord, and we deserve your punishment. And even our best actions, even the best things that we attempt are impure and deserving of your wrath. But you are rich in mercy and loving kindness. You've called us to repentance. You've called us your children. We've wandered far from you, and yet you sought us and saved us. Teach us, O oh Lord. Make us wise. Grant us understanding as we consider your scriptures. Provide help to me as I preach. Grant us understanding to know your ways. Lead us in right paths this morning and throughout each day. Our desire is to worship and praise you all for all your goodness towards us. Enable us to praise you as we ought. And it's in the name of our blessed Jesus that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I don't know if you got a chance to read the e-news or sort of the, saw the post on Facebook. I, I, there's some spoiler alerts. I mean, in case you couldn't guess, my family has always enjoyed C.S. Lewis. The Chronicles of Narnia stories are, are just tops on our list. And I, I've actually sometimes had to get after my kids because they didn't know their Narnian history as well as they ought. You know. In the book, um, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, is one of my favorites. One of the characters, Lucy Pevensey, is on this island where everybody is invisible. And so to avoid being attacked by these invisible creatures, Lucy makes a promise that she will go into a magician's study and find his spell book and recite the spell that will make things visible and thus restore everybody that was on the island into the way that they had been. Now, in this book, if you've read the story, you realize that the book has a couple of temptations in there for her. And she avoided falling into the first temptation, which was a spell that would magically make her the most beautiful wo woman in the world. <clears throat> and while she was looking at the book and seeing every spell had these pictures that were a part of it, and she saw pictures of what she would look like if she she spoke this spell, and she also saw the devastation and the hardship that it would bring to everybody, and so with great difficulty, she flips away from it. Now, later on, she comes to another spell that would enable her to hear what her friends think of her, and she succumbed to the temptation. And she, she heard what friends said about her, and it, it had some impacts on relationship. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I teach Sunday school earlier, and now I'm having a dry throat. So, um, 
So Lucy becomes a lot like us. We got temptations all around us. Sometimes we succeed, most often we don't, and we run into these difficulties. But in Lucy's case, what happens at the end is she finds the right spell, she recites it, everybody becomes visible, and she hears a noise behind her. And she spins around, and there is Aslan. <coughs> Aslan is a lion. And he's this character that is the, uh, yeah. I know, I left my water bottle there. I forgot about these, so, yeah. Is this lion who, he's the son of the great emperor over all the worlds. And he's a main character that Lucy is always drawn to. And Lewis, in his narrative of this scene, says that when Lucy turned and saw Aslan, if she could have seen herself, the radiant joy in her face made her as beautiful as the, the beautiful Lucy from the spell. Her love for Aslan transformed her whole being. We're beginning a series of topical sermons from Proverbs, and the elders have come up with the title for this one is, You Become What You Love. And so this topic reminded me of an old saying, an American proverb, as it would, that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. You know, I'm not sure that that tr is true all of the time, but we do see this showing up in Western culture over and over again. There's this whole genre of activities called cosplay. Anybody heard of it? That's where people of all ages dress up <coughs> excuse me, as their favorite uh, character, fictional character, story character, movie character, doesn't matter, you dress up as your favorite character, and you go to this convention, and you show off how well you're able to mimic the abilities of these characters, as well as you get a chance to like buy some new dress-up clothes and things like that. We also have people who do historical reenactments. So that rather than it being fantasy or, or, or fiction, they, they dress up as, as real people. Uh, my wife's cousin, he married, she married a man who has a whole different persona as a Union Army captain during the Civil War. And he actually accompanies Abraham Lincoln on his speaking tours. And so far, he's managed to keep Abraham out of Ford's theater. He hasn't been there in decades. And we also see things like this. You ever notice how amazing it is that a pet owner and a pet can start to look alike? I won't tell you that, well, maybe I will tell you. My favorite pet would be a beagle. So I hope I don't become, start morphing into a beagle. But there's a part of mankind that when we hold something in really high regard... We want to be like it, and we start becoming like it. James K. Smith described it this way, you become characterized by what you love because you pursue it and are changed in the process of pursuing it. When, you, when what you love is something or someone that is morally right and it's worthy of, of devotion, there, there's some mutuality that comes about in this whole thing. I want us to look again at, at this section from Proverbs 8 that kind of helps guide us in looking at uh, what we see in the rest of Proverbs. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have insight. I have power. By me, kings reign, and rulers issue decrees that are just. By me, princes govern, and nobles, and all who rule on the earth. I love those who love me. And those who seek me find me. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold. 
what I yield per, surpasses choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice, bestowing a rich inheritance on those who love me and making their treasures full. So we see here in Proverbs, um, Proverbs 8, and I touched on it last week, this love of wisdom by a young person, it's reciprocated, and it changes. It changes the one who loves wisdom. It should be something that catches your mind right here. You know, how is wisdom able to love? You know, it's an idea. It's a concept. Concepts, loving? No. It's got to be something more here. We've got to remember there's a personification going on in this section of Scripture. And, and you know, wisdom is set up as a person and, and so forth and, and has this ability to love. But what we're being driven to in Proverbs is, is coming back to chapter 1 of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know, it's our love for God and his love for us that changes us. Not wisdom or a moral approach or a philosophical construct. Those things can't love. God does. And so remember that through the Proverbs that we've been looking at has been this teaching of how God, the one true God, is being shown to us in these passages. It's not wisdom that should be the object of our love. We're to love the all-wise God. And I like this. I was listening to some of the things said earlier, and I, I felt, okay, yeah, okay, some, that's something I was going to touch on in my sermon. I hope that's another thing I was going to touch on. Sunday school class, there was other things that were touched on and stuff. So I was like, even though these things have been said, I'm going to repeat them. You know, what does it mean to become like what we love. Proverbs 23, 7 is something that a lot of people jump to. And don't, don't look it up just yet, because I only want you to see. I've heard people even say this. <clears throat> For as he thinks within himself, so is he. And I've even had that come to me as a warning from others that as I'm thinking inside, that's what I'm going to become. They, they, they say to me, imagine that this is a promise from God, and it means that if you're holding this in your heart, this is what's going to happen. This will become true of you. And so I like to call this the Proverbs 23-7 fallacy, because it's not true of us. A fallacy, it means a false notion. Or it's a statement that was based off of a false inference. We've kind of deduced something from it. This, reverses, this verse is recited like this, totally without context. So let's look at context here. Do not eat the bread of a selfish person or desire his delicacies. For as he thinks within himself, so is he. He says to you, oh yeah, eat, drink. His heart's not with you. You'll want to vomit up the morsel that you have eaten and waste your compliments. God is not saying that my mind or my heart can change my reality around me and make me into something else. This statement is him telling us, how do you deal with a selfish person? So when we talk about how we become what we love, it's not this self-generated reality-changing power at work that comes from within us. So if that's not what it is, what is Kevin talking about then? Well, there's a long-standing part of how we approach Scripture, whether it's like this Scripture, Proverbs 23, or whether it's some of the other ones. And it goes like this. The New Testament will help us to understand the meaning of the Old Testament. We saw that in the book of Hebrews. When we looked at chapter 1, it says that God spoke in many ways in the past through his prophets. 
But in this last time, he has spoken finally by his son. We get a clear message in the New Testament. His son delivers the clear message that we can't be fooled by. We can't mess up. So if we turn to the New Testament to understand what does it mean to become like what we love, then we'll start to see how that works out. And what it is is it it ties to commitment. It ties to where do we put our heart? Where do we focus things? This is another place where somebody stole my thunder from earlier. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. And, And Jesus is highlighting this thought of what you love, and he's tying it into the idea of treasure. Where is your treasure? Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This is not something that Christ is either arguing for or against. He's presenting it, and it's a given. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. What you value, what you desire, that's where your heart is. If we try and get syncretistic with our loves, it just won't work. Oh, you know, Lord, I I don't really love money. I just like it a lot, and I love you, so I'm good, right? No. We can't try to bring the two together. It doesn't function that way. If we try to hold on to both, we become a loser. We've got to be faithful to one. And that faithfulness needs to show up in our lives. If we survey the scriptural redemptive story, we we can see this borne out. Uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. Uh, Oops. Okay. I thought it was the next slide. Oh, there it is. Okay. Right there in the middle. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. You know, God is declaring to Abram that God is Abram's reward. Not heaven, not riches, not anything else. The reward that Abram was seeking was God, and that's what he got as a reward. John 17, 23, I think, is also up there. And and this is a a note where Jesus was talking with the Pharisees, and, um, or excuse me, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he was explaining to them what they needed to, uh, to understand. And he says to them, I and them, and thou and me, he's talking about, the Father and his people, that they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know that thou didst send me. And that's great. Okay, so if we're in unity, that gives the world the opportunity to see that God has has sent the Son. But he goes beyond that. He said, and that thou didst love them, even as thou didst love me. As the Father loves Jesus, that's how he loves his children who are in Christ. I mean, it's easy to see with, you know, the wonderful life that Christ lived, the perfection in all that he did. Oh, surely the Father would love that. that Who else could, could be loved except the Son? But what he's saying is that that also comes to us. The Father loves us that way if we are in the Son. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I really loved this verse because it helps us understand something. If you love me, if you love Christ, Christ is speaking to his disciples, if you love him, you will keep his commandments. What what comes first, the initial thing, is the loving of Christ. And what that doesn't mean is having warm, mushy feelings for God. Uh, In this usage, the Greek word agapeo, if you look it up in a lexicon, I use Thayer's Greek lexicon, it, it says that this use here involves the idea of affectionate reverence, prompt obedience, 
and grateful recognition of benefits received. This is the kind of love that like an enlisted soldier has for his trustworthy and renowned commander. You know, Paul uses this in, in 2 Timothy 2. He's writing to Timothy and he says that, Timothy, you should suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It's that same idea that we see here in John 14. And then Paul continues, he says, you can see it written right there for you. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he, he avoids that stuff so that he may please the one who has enlisted him as a soldier. That's not a mushiness. That's not sentimentality. That's devotion. Here's my commander. Look at what he's done for me. I'm going to obey his orders. And so that describes for us what we mean by becoming like what we love. That if we're loving Christ and we're seeking to be like him, that the first thing we need to do is understand his orders for us. What are his commands? How does he want us to live? How should I style my life? So the that describes what it means, what it looks like. We need to learn what it means to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I think somebody else said that this morning as well. It's not simply emotion. It's devotion. It's a dedicated life. It's, as Jim was talking, it's a commitment. I, I'm going to try to do this. Will I fail? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably fail even before I'm done with my sermon. But that's besides the point. I'm dedicating myself to it. It's an obedience to the wishes of the one that we've enlisted under. And you know, really, this, this is a pursuit worthwhile. It's not something easy that I can do in my own strength. It's not for the faint-hearted. We need a dedicated life. We need a devoted life. Well, how, how do we do that? How do we show that? What's it look like? Well, again... Here's what it isn't. Look at Galatians 3. And this I didn't put a slide for because I wanted us to actually look at it. I'll read it to you. Um, and you can either listen in or look at it. Galatians 3, the first five verses. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit... By the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he then, who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law? Or by hearing with faith. Paul asked the simple question. How did you begin your life as a follower of Christ? He asked each one of us that, that same question. How did we begin to be a follower of Christ? Well, I cleaned myself up. Took a shower, put on a nice shirt, tie. That's how I became. No. No. They knew it, Paul knew it, we knew it. We know it, I should say. We became followers of Christ by faith, not of works. And so that's how we began the Christian life. So then Paul asked the follow-up killer question. So how do you think you continue? Well, that's by me taking a shower, putting on a new shirt, tie, and everything, and doing it all in my own strength, right? Right? He calls them foolish. We don't want to be foolish. We begin by the Spirit. We continue by the Spirit. Let, let's dive into what, how, how did that beginning happen? Well, first, if we remember our, our study of Ephesians, the Holy Spirit worked in us. Remember, Scripture tells us we were dead in our sin. We were enslaved 
to evil powers. We did not have God, and we thought his commands were foolish. We needed a miracle. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. We are saved by the miraculous intervention of our loving God, and praise the Lord for that, because I never would have gotten it right. But then what happened? He's made us alive. We confess. We confess the truth about who he is. We confess the truth that we've denied God for so long. We confess that the one true God has laws, and we violated anything that, that, that suited us. We come to agree with everything that he says about us. We agreed with him that we are wicked. That's part of what confession is, is, is agreeing with his assessment of us. And then what happened? After we made all these confessions, the Bible uses the word repentance. We turned around. We, we turned in our, our way of walking. We repented of our former way of life. We turned away from the desires to be our own God. We turned away from our desire to live apart from the true God. And we turned away from all the ways that we tried on our own to either appease the real God or to fool him with our sinfulness. And then through the power of the Holy Spirit who is dwelling in us that has caused us to be alive in the things of God, to confess and to repent, we begin, we begin to walk in obedience. Isn't that wonderful? It's God from start to finish. He makes us alive. He makes us able to confess. He makes us able to repent. He makes us able to walk. Confess, repent, walk in obedience. Every day, multiple times each day. Confess, repent, walk. Confess, repent, walk. We began by faith. We walk by faith, and praise the Lord for that. I could never muster in myself enough dedication to do things right. Yet he's at work within me. We don't have a works-based salvation. Salvation doesn't come by anything that Kevin Larson did. However, once we are saved... We have a salvation that causes us to work. My commander saved me. I was in a terrible battle and I was losing. And the commander of the Lord's army saved me. I want to show my love. I want to be a top-notch soldier. I don't want to be a slacker. I want to be somebody that is, is, an, is an ornament in his army. If you look at the whole book of James, and I'm not going to go into James this morning, um, he talks about this, sums it up really nice and clearly. Faith without works is dead. I can't say I believe and have it have no impact on me. Because the power of the Holy Spirit, according to what Scripture tells us, is now in me. And I don't think the Holy Spirit's going to hang out in a polluted, corrupted temple. No, he's going to change it into what he wants it to be. We do not work for salvation, but because we are saved, we work. And we work with joy. We work to please the one who took us in. So without going into James, I'm just going to quickly jump to, to Ephesians and touch on a few things there. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Most of you all have it memorized. Think about its wonderful sayings. By grace are you saved through faith, and that is not of yourself. Well, you know, grace is never of ourselves. If I show grace to, you know, one of my kids, the grace was never from them. It was always external. So if I've received grace, it came from external. So when, when Paul said, it's not of yourself, he wasn't talking about the grace. He was even talking about the faith. Where did my faith come from? It's not of myself. It's the gift of God. Not of works, so no one should boast. And that's verse 9 of that section. And verse 10 brings us to a, a wonderful crescendo. Why did God do all those things? Why did he pour out grace? Why did he pour out faith? Why are all these things happening? Because we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Oh, 
So God's doing a work within me. That's what I was talking about, the Holy Spirit. He doesn't like a, a nasty, polluted temple. He's, he's making a temple fit for the Lord. He's doing a work within me. What work? His work. Okay. But we have been created for good works, is what Ephesians 2.10 says. Yep. That we should walk in them. And what's more, they were prepared beforehand. Before I came to faith, God had works that I was to, work, to walk in. And so we see what, what's being displayed here is that, yeah, we're saved by faith. It's that grace through faith. It's all a gift of God. And he expects us to walk a certain way. We're one of his soldiers. And how does that then, what does that then do to us? Romans 8, 29. You know that wonderful passage in Romans 8, 28? All things work together for good. Don't we love quoting that? It's such an encouragement. But in 29, it says, he predestined us to become conformed into the image of Christ. If I love Christ, he is at work. God is at work in me conforming me into the image of Christ. I am becoming like what I love. And that's what I want. That's a work in me that I want to see. There's too much garbage in me that I want, I want to see out. And that's why I really appreciated Jim's leadership and this idea of, these are the things I need help with. My brothers and sisters can help me with it. They can pray for these things for me. I'm being conformed into the image of Christ. Now, I don't want you to make mis a mistake on something. He's not going to make me divine. I don't become godly. No, I become godly. I don't become God. That's what I should have said. I am not going to be divine. There's some people running around in this world who do teach that. And you need to know right away that is not the truth. How can a finite creature become like the infinite, always existing? We can't. That's ridiculous. But there are some who teach that. Well, then how do we learn to become like Christ? Where do I see Christ so that I can be conformed into his image and, and, and know what are the good changes that God is making in me and what is the things that I need to repent of and confess? And, and well, I know. Maybe it's in scriptures. <laughs> Isn't that what Hebrews 1 was about? He's now spoken clearly through it. The Christian videos are not the way to become like Christ. And Christian fiction is not the way we learn to be like Christ. And, and I want to challenge us something on, for something. Those things are really childish imitations. They're the children's toys. We need to be adults. We need to look to the scriptures. It alone is the inspired work of God. Not any video, not any other book. This book is the inspired work, word of God. It alone is inerrant. It doesn't have errors. I guarantee you if I write a book, it'll have an error in it. This one doesn't. It alone is sufficient. I don't need this, and then, you know, our friends next door, they have a couple of extra books that they add to Scripture. I don't need that. I'm glad we have a resource center. There's some great information that helps teach us and instruct us on things, but Scripture is sufficient of itself. We become like Christ from Scripture, and he himself actually stated that. He, he told the Pharisees, you know what, you're studying the scriptures because you're thinking it, it has life, and it does. It speaks of me. I'm kind of paraphrasing that, that exchange with him. Scriptures point to Jesus. So if I want to become like my master, if I want to become like the commanding officer in whose army I've enlisted in, I need to know my scriptures. Micah 6, 8 has that famous verse that starts off, he has shown thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee? You know, we don't need to look anywhere else. 
We don't have to say, boy, I wish God would tell me what he wants in my life. If only God had written down his will for my life. Oh, yeah, he has. Have I learned it? That's where the difficulty comes in. He used that phrase, actually, I have shown thee, O man. He's used that a couple of times in the Old Testament because we're so stubborn. We're so foolish. He's got to repeat himself to get us to understand what we need to know. We don't need new information. He has told us all we need for faith and practice. We just got to learn it. Just realizing we are much later in time, so I'm going to now kind of jump ahead a little bit. I was going to hammer on that a bit more, that we have to learn what he says. And we can do that by these principles. We talked about some of them last week. I talked about some of them last week. But how the Old Testament, how, the, how, how Proverbs speaks of Christ. So if we come back to Proverbs... And I start looking at these. I'm going to see the things that point to Jesus. And it's those things that I need to learn. Yeah, I read the narratives in the Gospels. And that's good. I need to have that story in there. But, you know, the story doesn't tell you everything. Ever notice that? When you read a story, a historical narrative, you cannot know everything. And that's why you need to go to teaching to teaching passages in Scripture. They fill in what you need to know. So if we look at, at chapter 10 of Proverbs, in verse 3, we touched on this somewhat last week. The Lord will not allow the righteous to hunger, but he will thrust aside the cravings of the wicked. Well, what is that telling me about? It's telling me, if I'm, I'm truly righteous and I have desires, it's going to get satisfied. And those desires are righteous desires. It's to know God, to know our Lord Jesus Christ, to see him at work in my life. That's a desire he will fulfill. But what about the wicked person? They're thrust aside. The things they desire, they're not going to get. They're roughly pushed away from the things that they really need. Chapter 10, verse 23 and 24. I think I do have a slide for these ones. Yep. I love how this reads in the New American Standard. Doing wickedness is like sport to a fool, and so is wisdom to a man of understanding. What the wicked fears will come upon him, and the desire of the righteous will be granted. <laughs> Fools do wickedness just like sports. It's something they want to do. They're really into it. Wickedness is the pickleball of fools. Right? Couldn't resist that, brother. An understanding man, wisdom is his sport. Wisdom is the pickleball for the understanding. That's where we're, what we're faced with. What are we doing? Are we doing wickedness? If we're seeing that in our life, that tells us something about where our love is. It's not towards the Lord. But if the sport, the, the thing that we do because we love it and we enjoy it, is, is wisdom, that, that's showing us something of how, how the Lord is at work in us. Chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. The righteousness of the blameless will smooth his way but the wicked will fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright will deliver them, but the treacherous will be caught by their own greed. Someone acting blamelessly causes her path to be smooth, and she is delivered. But the wicked one is going to fall by her wickedness. She's going to be trapped by her lusts. Why? Because it's the things that she loves. She's patterning her life after that. Pattern your life after the Lord, and it's differently. An evil man, verse 18. The wicked earns deceptive wages, but he who sows righteousness gets a true reward. That's an evil man thinking that he can deceive God. Galatians talks about this. It says, don't be deceived. God's not mocked. 
Whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. And so the evil man is sowing wickedness, and he earns from it. He gets his, he gets his payment, but it's treacherous payment. It's not what he expected. He thought he was going to have it made and have it easy. Instead, he's got a deceptive wage that he's earned. But the righteous gets a reward. You know what? You don't earn rewards. Even though I'm with a credit card company, we have a rewards program. That's not how rewards happen. I reward somebody. I give presents out of the goodness of my heart. So we could see, we could look through some of these passages and see how this is pointing to something for us. Our love for Christ conforms us into the image of Christ, and we'll start seeing the same things. What makes me turn away from the wickedness? It's not my goodness. It's the Holy Spirit at work within me. And what it ties down to is worship. We're either going to worship the one true God, or we're going to manufacture an idol, and we'll worship it, and we'll become like what we love. We'll become like what we worship. Will you worship the Father by actively seeking to be conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, or will you worship a false God and be conformed into it? Mankind's heart is the greatest factory for the manufacturing of idols in the whole world. They could be crude idols that kind of look like something made by a child with Play-Doh. Or they could be a tremendous statue carved out of marble with intricate designs and stunning beauty. Regardless of what idol is manufactured, it's not the image of the one true God. If you desire to be like the Lord, have your work cut out for you. Not work for salvation, but the work of sanctification. And it's directed by God's word, and it's directing you to God the Son. If you're currently worshiping an idol of your own making, and it could be anything, it could be science, could be prestige, could be sex, could be anything, anything less than the one true God, will you turn from that idol? By your very own efforts, you're conforming yourself to that image, and it isn't pretty. The selfishness that you will highlight will eventually give way to bitterness because you've manufactured your own idol and you want to become like your own idol and then you're going to realize I don't get all that I want so that selfishness will lead to a bitterness you can't achieve what you set your heart on I've prayed that the Holy Spirit will be speaking to to all of us this day believers and unbelievers Will you confess the truth of what you already know? You can never be the God of the universe. Can you confess that Jesus is truly God incarnate? That he provided a ransom for the price that you owed? That Jesus was killed in your very place? And that he rose from the dead? Can you confess that you deserve punishment? And only a pardon will save you? If you seek the Lord, he will reveal himself to you. I've talked this pattern, confession, repentance, walking in a new life. Confession, repentance, walking. If you would like to learn about confession, repentance, and walking in a new life, under the command of someone who's a really great commander, talk with any of us after after the service. Find one of the pastors. Talk to me. 
we'd love to be a resource for you so that you can begin walking the way that the Lord has instructed. Let's pray. Father, it's because of the wondrous work of Jesus that we can call you by that beautiful name. We deserved death. We deserved the torments of hell. And yet you saved us. We praise you, Lord, for your good blessings that flow to us each day because of your great love, because of your love for our Master and our Lord Jesus Christ and for us who are your children. Lord, apart from your Spirit calling us, we'd be lost. Let your Holy Spirit call to the unsaved this morning. Bring them to the knowledge of the truth of Jesus. Pour out your grace and faith upon them. Father, may the Spirit also stir up those that are already yours. May he find us a willing and pliable enlisted soldier. Make us able to listen to the words of Scripture. Make us ready to obey what you've already shown us. We are sometimes too filled with knowledge of your teachings and we're not obedient to them. Bring our minds and our actions into conformance to your expressed will so that you, the almighty three in one, would be glorified in us. Amen.